so I think we can uh, we can start. <clears throat> um, this is a lecture. Um, I'm going to introduce our speaker in a second, of course, but um, just to give you a brief the context and the introduction. Uh, um, this is part of a of a class uh, and actually of a Jean Monnet. Um, chair I hold at the University of Trento uh, on uh, the Western Balkans and uh, uh, the European Union and the Western Balkans enlargement and uh, within this context uh, I have the opportunity to invite a few guest speakers uh, to talk to us about uh, uh, topics related to the European Union and the Western Balkans and uh, today it's a real pleasure to have uh, uh, Damir Kapitic uh, who is an associate professor of comparative politics uh, at the University of Sarajevo in Bosnia. Uh, his uh, research focuses on ethnic conflict, political parties, and power sharing, as well as the process through which democratic and authoritarian politics are institutionalized. He is the editor of a uh, recent special issue uh, of a journal called the Journal of Southeast European and Black Sea Studies, uh, which uh, for the students in Trento, I want to stress, is uh, actually available in our library, so you can download uh, papers. Um, and, and this special issue um, just came out recently, last year, um, was titled Illiberal Politics in Southeast Europe. And uh, so, again, it's a real pleasure to have you, Damir. And um, I, um, I guess last point um, by way of an introduction is to say that uh, I have posted a couple of um, articles on our um, um, page, uh, the class page. And, um, and uh, one of the articles is, uh, is by Damir called the Subnational Competitive Authoritarianism and our sharing in Bosnia and Herzegovina. And so I encourage you to, to read it, download it, and, and take a closer look. Um, let me. There are a couple of people at Twitter. Okay. And the final thing I had to say um, is the following. Um, uh, this lecture is taped and will be posted on the on the website of um, the Jamone Center of Excellence at the University of Trento. Uh, for privacy reasons, uh, um, I uh, need to um, make explicit that if you 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 are welcome to ask any question and identify yourself, but if you do so. Um, you also give the permission to be um, uh, that that your image and your name is actually available on the web on the on the page I mentioned. Um, so we'll have a we'll have a presentation and then of, and uh, as always there's going to be the opportunity to ask a few or some or many questions. Uh, Damir, again, thank you very much for being with us, and I I, I, I let you I give you the the stage, the virtual stage. Okay, thank you very much, Roberto. Um, I'm glad to be presenting today, and uh, I'll be talking about, um, well, first about power sharing, sort of as a way to resolve conflicts, uh, but then also more specifically about the case of Bosnia and Herzegovina, which is sort of uh, one of these cases that um, are emphasized most when it comes to uh, international intervention and power sharing. We will be mentioning the European Union to some extent because it is one of these main actors that have been involved and especially it is sort of the actor that is supposed to continue um, to try and reform the system of power sharing in Bosnia and Herzegovina today. So let me just share the presentation with you and um, I'll be using the presentation for one part but then later when we have the Q&A um, I'll also turn it off so that we can focus more on sort of each other there. Okay, so um, let's talk about implications of power sharing first a little bit. And this is something that we have to sort of, uh, you have, uh, Roberto told me that you have already talked about power sharing as a general concept, but this is also sort of a way to um, identify it a little bit more in this context. 
And it's important to note that, first of all, power sharing has become a, a mechanism that the international community uses to try and establish peace and democracy after conflict, and especially after ethnic conflict. It's sort of the go-to mechanism that has been in place since the 1990s. But at the same time, this is not because it has been very successful. It's not uh, that it has uh, unconditionally been able to uh, resolve or keep peace and democracy in every single context. Uh, rather, it is because the alternative forms of trying to manage uh, a country and especially democratic governance after conflict are even worse than power sharing is. So we have partition as an option, we have uh, majority rule as another option, and both can lead to much more uh, conflict than power sharing does. So it's sort of, one would could say a good alternative, but probably uh, not the best solution that you can have. It is something that um, sort of uh, is, is by itself um, a solution that produces, um, that, that has the best possible outcomes given the alternatives. Now, the other thing is that when we talk about power sharing, we have to keep in mind that this is an arrangement that needs to be institutionalized. So it's not just an informal arrangement that is in place, but there has to be some form of legal institutionalization that includes all of the key groups in a society. Now, be this in Iraq, one has to include the Sunnis, Shias, and Kurds. In Bosnia, for example, one has to include the Croats, the Serbs, and the Bosniaks. Um, the other sort of thing that one that I will refer to is I will talk a lot about Bosnia and Herzegovina because this is also the country that I uh, most am most familiar with and work on. Um, and commonly, Bosnia and Herzegovina is understood as one single country, but it has sort of these two entities, which are essentially federal units of the country. Um, it includes three so called constituent peoples, which are the main ethnic groups in this country. And there are 14 semi independent governments, each of which retains some level of uh, exclusive policymaking in the country itself. And the thing is that. Uh, there is power sharing between all of these elements above. So there is power sharing between federal units, there is power sharing between different groups, um, but there's also a strong level of sort of individual rights and freedoms embedded in the constitution, um, all of which makes it a very complex political system, um, which I will try to explain to you as much as I can. So, what we'll be doing today, um, I'll give a brief overview of the history of Bosnia-Herzegovina, of the conflicts that happened, uh, the foundations of ethnicity and identity, and uh, we'll have a very brief Q&A after each of these sessions, so if there's something you sort of want to ask right away, you can do that then. Um, if you have any sort of longer questions for discussion, we can keep those to the end. Uh, the second part I'll talk about consociationalism as sort of a very specific form of power sharing um, and the way it is used as a peace building mechanism. And I'll also mention imposed power sharing. So where power sharing is something that is uh, part of an international agenda. Then I'll talk about the political system of Bosnia-Herzegovina, which is an outcome of the sort of previous two aspects, um, how this translates into political parties, uh, constitutional functional elements of power sharing um, and the difference between these institutionalized constitutional elements uh, and the sort of functional more informal elements of power sharing uh, in this case. I'll talk a little bit about federal aspects and how this translates uh, towards non-democratic rule and how it can lead to more authoritarian rule and I'll also um, sort of conclude with um, the elections, the electoral systems, um, the party system, and how all of this above, how uh, sort of a rigid power sharing actually leads to a, uh, a system where ethnicity is reified, where it is sort of strengthened uh, in relation to the country, in relation to citizenship and the state. Now, to start off with a few pictures, Bosnia-Herzegovina is, um, in essence, a multi-religious community where this religious sort of diversity has been translated 
into what we now call ethnic diversity, um, sort of by uh, building national identity. Each of these groups was founded, that we have in Bosnia, was founded on the religious differences that exist. Um, to keep it then short, there, the conflict in the 1990s, from 1992 to 1995, saw an escalation around the question of should Bosnia and Herzegovina become independent uh, or should it remain within part of the rest of Yugoslavia, which essentially would have changed majority minority relations in the country itself. Um, and uh, especially turning the Serbs from a majority in, in including in the whole Yugoslavia into a minority in just Bosnia and Herzegovina. The war lasted from 1992 to 1995 and um, had along with it widespread destruction and atrocities. Um, you can see some of the elements, the um, graveyards around Srebrenica where the genocide was committed in the lower left, uh, the bridge in Mostar in lower center, which was destroyed in 1993 and the streets of Sarajevo in the upper right corner. I'll be very brief about this because Roberto already told me that you sort of went through it a little bit. Um, so Bosnia-Herzegovina for a long part of its history was part of Yugoslavia, of various iterations of Yugoslavia, uh, thereby for the most part retaining its uh, geographical borders, although not uh, always some form of governance autonomy. This sort of governance autonomy was only sort of reconstructed, one could say, after 1974, where um, sort of larger elements of governance were transferred and to Bosnia-Herzegovina by decentralization uh, at the Yugoslav level. Now, all of this sort of culminated in 1992 when um, Yugoslavia was starting to break apart. And this is when um, this is when you, we had the independence referendums first starting in Slovenia, then Croatia, and then also in Bosnia in 1992, which uh, put this question of the future of the country uh, up, up on the agenda. And this is where you can see a difference in politics between uh, sort of representatives of Serb political parties and those of other political parties. Um, this sort of culminated in, in armed conflict in 1992 which sort of stretched throughout Yugoslavia, starting in Slovenia, which declared independence, then in Croatia, uh, where the war also lasted during this phase, and in sort of most, uh, most explicitly in Bosnia, where the war was uh, the fiercest and also had the most casualties. Um, during the Bosnian war, you saw essentially three sides fighting each other, along with international uh, assistance by neighboring states, Croatia and Serbia. So it is what we usually call a hybrid war um, or, or a new war, where you cannot clearly define the boundaries between international conflict and civil war. This sort of ended in the Dayton Peace Agreement in 1995, which uh, includes the constitution of Bosnia and Herzegovina. Uh, so the constitution of the country is an annex to this peace agreement. And within it are several elements of power sharing. Uh, so in a sense, uh, power sharing was already embedded into the peace agreements and into the constitution that was part of it. Another aspect is that there was a strong international involvement uh, through peacekeeping and state building missions starting even during the war, but especially after 1995, 1996 where you had um, very large peace implementation forces within NATO um, in Bosnia and Herzegovina, then later on um, the Office of the High Representative, which sort of was able to impose even certain policies. Um, it still can, but it's not using those powers any longer. What we usually have is as a consequence of all of this, so I'll come to this sort of aspects of the Dayton Peace Agreement and international intervention a bit later as well, what we have as a consequence of all of this is a persistent peace in the country. So there has been no major reversal towards violence. There has been no flare up of conflict uh, since 1995, since the end of 1995. But at the same time, there's been very little integration in the country. So you can see that uh, the individual groups who fought the war and the political parties that represented them during the war 
are still more or less divided. Uh, there is very little sort of uh, um, commonality uh, and except of living next to each other. There's no sort of sense of living together. And the question is, can we call this a success? Uh, when you have no conflict, but when the state itself is sort of in a limbo uh, of still being seen as a, a forced community of living together rather than something that you sort of see as your own. It's always sort of the question of an uncompleted state or an uncompleted national ambition. Now, why is this so? It's, as I mentioned, Bosnia is a multi-religious community where there is a very strong significance of religion. It is sort of the defining factor of identity. And the three major religious groups are Roman Catholics, uh, which usually uh, are aligned with sort of Croat ethnicity, Orthodox Christians aligned with Serb ethnicity, and Muslims, Sunni Muslims aligned with Bosniak ethnicity. There are many other minorities which make up about 5% of the population, including Jews, Romas, atheists, and so on. Um, and of course, also those who do not define themselves along any other lines, sort of just as citizens of the country. But it is very significant to say that religion is the basis of ethnic identity. Um, other aspects such as language uh, are more or less constructed as basis of identity. So all of these three groups speak a language with that, in which they mutually understand each other. Uh, all of them more or less look the same. So when you meet someone on the street, you cannot essentially say which group he or she belongs to. Uh, but once they say their name, and name is always sort of tied to religion, you can identify that person as belonging to one of these three groups. <clears throat> That said, there is significant interactions between uh, members of these groups. So you see people working together, you see people um, basically interacting on an everyday basis. But when it comes to private life and especially marriage, you see that there is sort of a dividing line. There's very little intermarriage along those lines. And it's also important to say that you have this intertwined political expression of identity uh, where it's not just identity in Bosnia itself, which is relevant in this case, but for example, you have uh, Croats which listen to uh, Croat media coming from Croatian media coming from Croatia, and the same for Serbs, uh, sort of looking to Belgrade, to Serbia for a lot of their uh, cultural and identity related issues. So it's sort of an, an international aspect of identity that also is is relevant where national identity in each of these two countries also plays out into Bosnia and Herzegovina itself. And finally, it's relevant to say that we have we can see um, an ethnic homogenization in terms of territory as a result of the war. And here I want to share this map with you, um, where sort of before 1991, uh, Bosnia was more or less described as a patchwork of different. Uh, different groups living in different parts of the territory, that there were very few clear uh, areas or lines uh, in the country that were dominated by one group. And this changed after the war. And uh, the census in 2013 is a good example where you can see that there are much fewer areas where you have diversity. Most of the areas have a very clear ma majority uh, population and uh, in those areas with a clear majority population, you still have minorities there, but they are no longer uh, very relevant minorities. They, they have much less, uh, much, much less power, much less to say. So are there any questions in this regard about history, um, the Bosnian War, foundations of ethnicity, religion, common identity, anything that at this moment? Um, sorry, I, I was asking myself if uh, also the educational systems are still divided. So separated, uh, for example, uh, also with, uh, I don't know if, uh, because in Italy we um, are taught uh, uh, um, religion, so Catholic, Catholic religion. And so I was thinking if um, there was a similar um, 
um, educational system for, um, for example, these uh, different groups? Yes, that's a good question. Uh, they, there is. So education is essentially divided, um, but not on every subject. There is something called a core group of national related subjects, which is language, religion, uh, history. Uh, I think geography falls into this as well, where you have nationally differentiated curricula. Um, each student learns a different history of, of Bosnia-Herzegovina, for example. Um, and which is a problem in itself. Um, and sort of the other subjects, which sort of natural sciences, physics, biology, those are more or less the same, but you do have differentiation along these lines. And in some cases, you also have um, two schooling systems in the same place, where one school is taught, for example, a Croat curriculum, and the other school is taught a Bosniak curriculum. So yes, you do have that. Thank you very much. Okay, if there are no more questions for now, we'll get back to questions later. So anything that you sort of have in mind, you can ask then as well. Uh, the next sort of aspect, uh, it looks at sort of consociationalism as a tool uh, of peace negotiations. And in the, in the upper sort of right corner, you can see the signing of the Dayton Peace Agreement, which, which was held in Paris in 1995. Um, and interestingly enough, it was signed by the presidents of Croatia, Serbia, and Bosnia to end the war in Bosnia. But the Dayton Peace Agreement is actually a regional agreement, which includes provisions for the neighboring countries as well. Um, a lot of this related to consociationalism has to do with maps and borders. Um, and in Bosnia-Herzegovina, you had sort of defined through that peace agreement uh, where sort of the dividing line between the two sides should be, except for one small uh, area in the north of Bosnia, which is this town of Brčko that you can see on that map. Um, which sort of connected both parts of Republic of Srpska and both parts of the Federation and, in a sense, uh, was, was an issue that had to be resolved later on. Um, but then again, this is something that uh, when you do not have a full agreement, you sort of leave it on the side. It's sort of one of these elements of consociationalism that are also interesting to look at. Um, you have sort of symbols as well. And here you can see sort of flags of Bosnia and Herzegovina, the two lower ones of the Federation and uh, the Republic of Srpska are not in use anymore because they have been declared unconstitutional. Uh, they do not represent all of the people living in that part. So Republic of Srpska flag sort of represented only Serbs uh, without representing any of the two other uh, peoples. Um, and the same goes for the Federation of Bosnia-Herzegovina flag, which has no sort of Serb uh, sig symbols in it, um, which was deemed a, a discrimination um, because of the consociational system. And the flag of Bosnia-Herzegovina itself, the yellow triangle with the stars, was actually sort of, uh, first of all, uh, designed on purpose to be sort of representative of everyone, but then also it was not adopted by the parliament, but it was imposed uh, by the international community on the country itself. And on the lower right, you can see sort of one of these elements of power sharing, which is the government of Bosnia-Herzegovina, the so-called Council of Ministers. And I'll talk about that uh, a little bit later as well. So about consociationalism as peace building, and especially as a tool for conflict resolution and building peace. Um, there is this um, notion that you need to think about formalized power sharing. Um, on the one hand, sort of consociationalism as a formalized type of power sharing and more uh, flexible power sharing arrangements. Um, usually when you think of uh, international intervention, you can choose between either one of these. So which elements of power sharing you want to formalize, be it through a constitution or through other laws, and this is something that becomes quite rigid in the end. But you can also opt for more flexible power sharing arrangements. And when we mean flexible power sharing arrangements, these are, uh, again, they can be institutionalized, but they're not precisely defined. 
Uh, for example, you can say that each group has a veto, but not define the rules and everything that goes along with it. There's also informal arrangements, and these can also be quite flexible. So the formalized power sharing aspects, they mostly build on experiences of the Netherlands, um, partially of Switzerland, and they're sort of uh, to be found in the works of Arendt Leipjart, while sort of more flexible power sharing arrangements, uh, they build on, on a more sort of uh, organic understanding of power sharing. And this is what uh, Donald Horowitz um, has emphasized through his works. Uh, and can be found in countries uh, such as Malaysia, um, such as Papua New Guinea, Guinea, and so on. But they are not as uh, safe, to put it that way, as formalized power sharing is. They can be much easily, much more easily subverted. Now, the four key elements of consociationalism, and I'll focus a little bit more on consociationalism because this is what we have in Bosnia and Herzegovina to the large extent. Uh, the four key elements, and Roberto told me you already mentioned this, uh, are a grand coalition in government. This is mostly focusing on the executive government um, at the national level, but all can also focus on subnational levels as well. Uh, proportional representation. And here the focus is largely on the legislature, but then again, also um, in public administration, in courts and other, other areas of governance, but it's most important in legislature so that you have um, an equal um, representative uh, amount of each group um, in, that, in that body, but also that this in some way more or less mirrors the population as such. Uh, by the way, the grand coalitions means that each group is represented in government, that each has some share or an equal share in government as such. Um, mutual veto. Mutual veto is basically where each group has the ability to, uh, to set a veto on certain issues or on general issues. And finally, we have segmental autonomy. Uh, and this can be either territorial autonomy, where each group has um, a certain territory that it governs, sort of a federal unit, for example. Or it can also be non-territorial autonomy, where each group has certain policy areas where it can sort of uh, set its policies, such as schooling, um, for example, or, or even policing. And then finally, it is worth to mention that this type of formalized power sharing, um, but also elements of more flexible arrangements, they're very often used as peace building mechanisms following conflict. Uh, Bosnia and Herzegovina is one of these prime examples where it was first established and used uh, so that you can actually more or less consider it as a um, as one of the main sort of driving elements there. Um, then you also have it in countries such as Macedonia, in countries such as Kosovo, where several of these elements have become more important um, and they have also been incorporated um, in, in power sharing as such. About how you get to this, and this is sort of something where, where there is a need to be, um, to, to introduce other actors as well, international actors, um, that power sharing in, in all of the cases that I mentioned, so Bosnia, Macedonia, and Kosovo, is not something that arose organically from within, but it was very much tied to international intervention. There is this idea of imposed power sharing uh, that is also mentioned in literature. So you have interventions, uh, where interventions have produced power sharing arrangements. Um, and you have um, imposition of power sharing also through peace agreements. Now, these two sort of link together. Intervention in this case is trying to stop a conflict and sort of seeing power sharing as a solution. Um, imposition is also using one's force sort of as, as an international actor uh, to shape the peace agreement, um, mostly through mediation, but sometimes also through, uh, through a little bit of, of stronger pressure by external actors to include power sharing elements in, in these arrangements. And external actors that have been active in the Balkans uh, related to imposition of power sharing are sort of a very wide range. You have 
the European Union, which uh, was very active in Macedonia, but then also in Bosnia and in Kosovo, uh, NATO as well uh, in Bosnia and in, in Kosovo part in particular, the United Nations, uh, the United States of America, um, and also sort of individual countries which had some impact there or worked multilaterally through these institutions. So in this sense, power sharing is seen as a way out, you could say, um, as a way out of conflict. And then again, also as a way to create a functional state through sort of building institutions that uh, will no longer uh, revert back to conflict. Um, you have these, in a sense, when you think about it, you also have additional questions. Uh, and this is especially about what happens after international intervention sort of comes to a close. Uh, usually there is this idea of transferring uh, local ownership of these institutions to uh, to the countries, to the uh, actors in these countries themselves. Um, there is also this question of international withdrawal. And uh, these two are very much linked to this idea of how do you transfer ownership, uh, but then also how do you organize international withdrawal? Um, now, related to it is also the issue of legitimacy of internationally imposed power sharing. Um, this legitimacy of the process uh, is very much linked to the question of how do you include the local populations. So if you have sort of an imposition of power sharing, it's usually something that happens top down, um, where power sharing is seen as a tool to achieve a certain outcome. But it does not very much try to relate to this question of how is this seen by local populations. Um, and especially the outcome uh, in relation to local democracy and accountability. Um, Bosnia-Herzegovina is a good example of this, when you have, where you have a very strong international imposition of power sharing mechanisms, which basically uh, sort of sidelined local politicians um, in very much of, of what they did and did not allow them to take any accountability uh, for their misactions, something that they did not, uh, were not able to, to achieve. So anything that was uh, a problem, an issue, was always a problem, an issue because of the international community. Uh, while there is or was, um, uh, there is still some form of legitimacy in this imposed international power sharing, um, this legitimacy is, is very much questioned in Bosnia and Herzegovina. This, the core elements of the Dayton Peace Agreement uh, they're very much debated um, on what they actually mean. And the other thing in terms of the impact on local democracy has been that a lot of the local elites did not ascribe to a sort of more uh, accountable form of democracy, uh, but they ascribed to a form of democracy where they could shift blame uh, and shift accountability towards other, especially international actors, and blame it all on them something that you can see in the European Union when blaming Brussels is also uh, a very uh, common way of dealing with local problems. So international sort of intervention has its own issues, its own problems in this sense. Um, okay, so any questions that you would want to ask on this about power sharing sort of as, in theoretic, as a theoretical aspect? Uh, I was wondering if uh, you could go a bit into the relation between the uh, this local power sharing arrangements and the role of the uh, high representative for Bosnia and Herzegovina. Okay, um, I will get to that shortly when I talk about sort of the political system and elements of power sharing, um, but I can actually I could do that right now. So. Um, I don't think I have a separate slide for the high representative. I can do that now. Um, I mean, the basic idea is that the role of the high representative is to uh, ensure and implement a, a sort of good implementation of the Dayton Peace Agreement. That's his basic role. 
um, that there is no violations of elements of that agreement and that the politics of, of local actors, of politicians, uh, are in line with, um, with the DPA, with the Dayton Peace Agreement. So those are sort of basic elements of this. Um, now, his sort of ability to intervene in the system, or it's based on something that we that is that are called the bond powers. Um, and the bond powers were sort of granted to him by the Peace Implementation Council. Uh, the Peace Implementation Council, on the other hand, is a group uh, of representatives from states uh, of all the major powers that were involved in uh, negotiating and signing of the Dayton Peace Agreement. Uh, the most important roles there are sort of the big powers, uh, the United States, Russia, um, various European countries, uh, but also Turkey, and there's international organizations involved as well, such as the European Union, the Islamic Conference, and so on. The role here is to try to ensure that uh, elements uh, of the Dayton Peace Agreement, that uh, if they were to be violated, that they might result in renewed conflict, and so that this does not happen. Um, now, the High Representative has something, has a very sort of extensive authority to basically do anything, uh, any change in the political system, except to change the constitution itself. Um, and this goes from um, sort of uh, um, imposing legislation that is, that can lead to, um, to better implementation of the Dayton Peace Agreement. Uh, this goes to um, sort of, uh, um, Get, taking mandates away from elected politicians, be this uh, in the presidency of Bosnia Herzegovina or in the parliament, um, and also imposing sanctions on them uh, for political action. It's, it's a sort of a very large scope that he has as, uh, as an ability to, to intervene. Um, in more recent years, and, and this has been extensively used throughout 2006, but in more recent years, in the last 10 years or so, uh, the high representative has taken more of a sort of uh, backseat role, trying to uh, intervene less. And especially in the past few years, um, there has been also less ability for him to intervene because the body which appoints him, the Peace Implementation Council, um, because of the presence of Russia in that council, has not been able to formulate sort of common goals, common policies for him to uh, to seek to intervene into. So it, it's sort of a role of, a, you could call it a viceroy or, or um, a ruler with, with very little accountability. And I mean, do not make, though the office of the high representative is, is definitely a part of the functional political system of Bosnia and Herzegovina. Um, it, it, the office interacts with various actors in, in Bosnian politics. Uh, it's just that this interaction is, is not codified through the constitution itself. That was a little bit extensive, but I hoped it answered some of the question. Okay, if you don't have anything else right now, then I'll move to the next one which is sort of about the political system of Bosnia and Herzegovina. And here, uh, again, a few pictures we can see in the upper uh, left corner, the three presidents of Bosnia and Herzegovina uh, who rotate each uh, on, who are directly elected, but rotate on who is uh, currently presiding over that collective body called the presidency of the country. Uh, with Frederica Mogherini. Uh, so whenever a foreign uh, visitor comes to the country, you usually have all three of them present um, and interacting with that person. Um, on the upper right is the parliament of Bosnia Herzegovina, the, um, the main chamber or the larger chamber. And um, I'll, come, I'll talk about the parliament itself uh, in the next slide. On the lower right is the uh, building of the parliament and of the institutions of Bosnia and Herzegovina. And in the lower right uh, is the parliament of Republika Srpska, which is one of these two entities or federal units of the country itself. 
So a little bit about the political system and about, and I also mentioned these consociational elements that were included that have sort of this very strong power sharing aspect to them. So what we have today in Bosnia is called the Dayton Constitution. And just simply because it is an element of the Dayton Peace Agreement included as Annex 4 of that peace agreement. And essentially it looks, um, it, is, it is sort of one that has uh, never, it is a constitution that has never been adopted uh, by the parliament of the country, uh, nor by its people. It's been signed by Croatia, Serbia, and, and at that time, Republic of Bosnia-Herzegovina. So it is a very strange constitution to begin with. Um, the elements include uh, a tripartite presidency, which is essentially three presidents working together um, in one political body as the head of state. And they rotate in this position. So they are elected um, directly by the people. One of these three belongs, uh, has to be of Serb ethnicity, and he or she is elected from Republika Srpska. Uh, the other two, one has to be a Bosniak, the other a Croat, and those two have to be elected from the Federation of Bosnia and Herzegovina. Um, now, you already there you can see sort of problems because there are no place for any other minority or a group that does not identify with the status, with one of these three uh, peoples. And this has also been highlighted um, as an element of the constitution uh, that needs to be changed by the European Union and the European Court of Human Rights. In terms of the legislature, um, Bosnia-Herzegovina has a bicameral parliamentary assembly um, with two chambers. One is called the House of Peoples, the other is called the House of Representatives. And it is one of the smallest parliaments in the world, actually, and especially in relation to population size, with 42 people, 42 members, uh, in the House of Peoples, and only 15 members in the House of Representatives, uh, which gives sort of the entire number of uh, members of Parliament at, at 57. Uh, for a country of uh, a little bit less than three and a half million, this is a very small Parliament. Uh, the House of Peoples, which has 15 members, um, all of these 15 members uh, five have to be Bosniaks, five have to be Croats, five have to be Serbs, uh, again elected from the various parts of the country. And here you can see again a problem of where do you fit the others in. Um, the House of Representatives uh, is elected by proportional representation. This is where this consociational element of proportionality comes in. Um, and uh, these are elected uh, based on the population shares uh, of the whole country as such, but also with uh, a defined distribution between Republika Srpska and the Federation, when there you can see this power sharing on a territorial level as well. Um, I mean, the same goes for the presidency, there's sort of territorial aspects to the election of that. And in the House of Peoples, you also have this sort of uh, proportionality principle where each of the groups has five people in that chamber. So. In, this, in, in these two bodies, you can see sort of consociation elements very strongly present. And all of this is codified. So all of these electoral aspects, they're pretty much codified into who uh, gets elected where and how. Um, in terms of the executive, you, we also need to mention the Council of Ministers, which is the head of government. Um, and this is sort of the executive government of the country. So the presidency, it's, it's much like the Italian presidency. It is very uh, representative as a head of state, but does not have very many governance competences. These are the Council of Ministers. And the Council of Ministers, it's, it's uh, sort of put together again of various political parties and you have to have all, um, all ethnic groups involved, all ethnic groups included in the government. Now this is not formalized. There's no sort of rules that say that the government has to do this, mm -hmm. but since the Council of Ministers needs to be appointed by the Parliamentary Assembly, um, any group can sort of put a veto into this appointment if their ministers are not present in the Council of Ministers. Uh, this, is where <clears throat> this is where more informal aspects of consociationalism come in. 
Um, finally, there is the chairman of the Council of Ministers, which is the, oh, sorry, the chairman of the Council of Ministers, which is the sort of prime minister of the country. And uh, currently we have um, a person of Serb ethnicity as the prime minister. Uh, the last government had a Bosniak as the prime minister, and there is a rotation in this prime minister role. Again, it's not formalized, it's not codified, but this is something that is an informal aspect of power sharing, where the head of government also rotates between the different ethnic groups. Um, in addition to this, there is very strong subnational governments and parliaments. And this is where you can see this element of uh, territorial autonomy. And especially of uh, sort of group autonomy. And this is, uh, element is, is seen in both the entities, so in Republic of Srpska and the Federation of Bosnia, but also in the cantons of the country as such. Um, there's a very um, stark division of competences where the state level, the level of the country has very little uh, governing competences and the most competences of governing, including police, schooling, universities, are located at some national levels of government. And in this sense, there's sort of a division. There's very many institutionalized constitutional elements of power sharing that uh, define especially the main bodies of the state. Um, and this uh, power sharing, it's also included in the subnational governments as well, where you have a certain allocation of seats um, in the parliament for different groups, for example both in Republika Srpska and in the Federation, and even at lower levels of government. But there are also several functional elements of power sharing where you have uh, sort of a non-codified aspect that is included, um, where power between the groups is alternated, uh, just simply because that's, that's the way that it was done, and that's the way that it is done. Now, it's very difficult to sort of try to map all of this out on uh, and sort of on the chart. And this is one example from uh, one online example. And it, in my opinion, it's much more confusing. It, it sort of tries to confuse more than it says with the different levels of government, with the different bodies. And even on this sort of representation, you are missing sort of arrows of accountability and who am elects whom. Uh, so this is something that is also not included even in that. Now I'll talk a little bit about political parties in Bosnia and Herzegovina because this they form the basis of what we have as power sharing. Um, in the Arendt Leipjart model of consociationalism, political parties are seen as the main uh, representatives of the group, the champions of their ethnic groups. And uh, this is also very much the case in Bosnia and Herzegovina um, and has been sort of, if you look at it, in a broader sense, historically the case. So it is probably also one of the reasons that consociationalism was adopted um, and that it is still functioning in the country as such. Now, political parties in the country, uh, they originated uh, during Austro-Hungarian rule, so over a hundred years ago. And in the first parliament of the country, uh, you already had seats defined uh, by religious belonging. Uh, so the Orthodox Christians had a defined number of seats. Catholics had a defined number of seats. Um, Muslims had a defined number of seats and, and Jews at that time also had a defined number of seats. And political parties organized around this division uh, of, of seats, uh, allocated seats in the parliament. Um, in the first sort of Yugoslav elections following World War I, you already had parties contesting uh, these the ethnically defined seats as such. Um, and this is where you have this very strong religious cleavage, uh, where political parties are based on religion and they define themselves uh, towards other religions. At the same time, so starting after World War I, you had an increase in uh, sort of worker-based cleavages. Um, you, you don't have so many others of the, of the Western European cleavage divisions, but there was a very strong division between uh, sort, of, sort of workers and, and, um, and owners of, of, uh, of capital at that time. 
Um, and most of this was also based around communist understandings of politics uh, and also included um, atheists. So non-religious people of Bosnia and Herzegovina, which were drawn to this sort of other alternative cleavage. Um, so in a sense, you had parties that were based on religion and that defined themselves in relation to other religions, but then also worker based uh, parties which define themselves non-religiously and more on other terms. Um, in the period from 1945 to 1990, very little of this actually mattered because you had a single party in government, the Communist Party of Yugoslavia. Uh, and during this time, religion was not seen as, uh, as something that should be relevant or that is allowed to be relevant in politics. It was something that was very relegated to the private sphere. But starting in 1990, you had a resurrection or a reemergence of ethnic parties that based themselves on religion. And these uh, parties in the 1990s, uh, they essentially emerged as representatives of the entire religious group. So there was essentially uh, one main party for Bosniaks, one main party for Serbs, and one main party for Croats in 1990. And there was the Communist Party for everyone else. And this is sort of the main division at that time. Um, and already then you could see that the parties, the ethnic parties, they fought at first together against uh, the one party rule against the Communist Party at those elections in 1990. But as soon as those were over, they started to define themselves against each other, against other uh, religious parties uh, from these other groups. And this is where you had the sort of uh, contest and competition between different ethnic parties in 1990. Um, ethnic party politics, they, they, again, as I said, they're very much based on religion as such, and they're very much based on uh, a form of representation that is, is descriptive, where people try to, or people vote for uh, politicians that actually uh, are very much like them they vote for especially those which are of the same religion. So if you look at um, sort of voting lists or, or uh, ca candidate lists of ethnic parties in Bosnia Herzegovina, you usually find only people of a, one single ethnic group represented in that. Well, and the other form, when you have sort of representation which is substantial, which looks at policies, uh, this is very difficult to find. Uh, you don't usually come across that too much. And what you have as a, as a consequence is that many of these ethnic parties, they usually have no uh, clearly defined party programs. They have very sort of uh, either broad or, or they essentially reuse the same party program in every election um, because their main party program is about protecting the ethnic interests of their peoples. Um, and then just defined in any, any different, different uh, type. And this is something that's uh, also a problem um, in consociationalism, where you uh, solely focus on representing your group, where you solely focus on this aspect of descriptive representation um, and much less on actual governance, which then leads to very poor and ineffective governance uh, in the end. Um, yeah, let's take, let's see if there's any sort of Q and A issues here. Uh, I also added two sort of aspects related to conditionality and EU key. If if you want to talk about those as well, that's good. That's fine. So anything that you want to ask re in relation to this? Okay, if not, then I'll, I'll move on for now, if that's okay with you. And this is specifically looking at one aspect of power sharing, which is a territorial aspect. Um, and there will be maps here, just as a warning. Um, so here, for example, in the upper right corner uh, is a sign when you're leaving Sarajevo but at the same time, it is on the border between the Federation and the Republic of Srpska, where there's also a sign welcoming you to the Republic of Srpska as well. Um, 
there is no sort of uh, other visible way that you have entered another part of the country, no sort of uh, roadblocks or, or controls or anything, uh, at least not since, since around 1997. So there has been freedom of movement in the entire country for a very long time, except that you see these administrative aspects. Um, and in the lower right, you, you can see this division between Republika Srpska and, and the Federation, which is very sort of haphazard. Uh, it, it does not follow any geographical or uh, population related lines. It, it's purely an outcome of the conflict. So essentially the border between the two subnational parts of the country uh, is, is sort of a frozen moment in time where the armies uh, armies were in 1995, more or less, of course. Um, I'll discuss the map with a question mark later because this is very much related to all of the subnational divisions of units. And in the lower left hand corner, you can see sort of various signs, insignia of, of uh, municipalities throughout the country. All of these have been declared unconstitutional. Um, this was sort of a part of the homogenization of these municipalities that they were also visually interpreted as being much more strongly belonging to one community than the other. And uh, a lot of them, since you don't use any insignia at all, um, some of them have changed them. Um, but this is sort of an aspect that, that was present for a very long time. It's still present to some extent that there is one community that tries to represent, tries to be more strongly represented. So in terms of the federal elements of, of power sharing and um, Arendt Leipjart mentioned, it does not have to be territorial power sharing. It does not have to be federal. Uh, con power sharing as a form of resolving conflict uh, should include some form of group autonomy. Um, federalism is sort of the highest uh, level of group autonomy that you can have, uh, say, for independence itself. Now, in Bosnia-Herzegovina, you we don't formally talk of as a federation. It's constitutionally not defined as a federal country, but essentially it functions as a federation. The elements, the subnational elements, uh, are represented at the state level, and they have a lot of authority uh, to essentially make it function as a as a federal country, as a federal uh, federal yeah federal country, uh, this great significance of subnational units can be seen in in several aspects. It can be seen in aspects of um, the competences, the governance competences, uh, where the constitution itself defines what Bosnia and Herzegovina should sort of do and govern. So foreign policy, uh, monetary policy, and so on. But everything else is then relegated to the subnational units. And this everything else uh, is a very broad category. It defines, it, it, it's sort of an extensive one. Um, so uh, the, what Bosnia and Herzegovina is constitutionally allocated in competences is very narrow in relation to what the Republika Srpska and the Federation of BIH get. You can also look at the aspect of funding where you can see how much uh, of the budget is allocated to subnational units. And all right, also there you can see that uh, the largest budget does not belong to the country, to the country level institutions, but to the subnational institutions of, of Bosnia and Herzegovina. Um, there are two entities, we call them entities. They're sort of the basic elements of this federal uh, system. The, and this is sort of uh, sometimes difficult to, 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 uh, to explain. Uh, the Federation of Bosnia and Herzegovina is one of these subnational units, um, while the country itself is just called Bosnia and Herzegovina. And there's Republika Srpska as the other, other entity, the other subnational unit. There's also District Birchko as a third one, uh, which is essentially a territorial condominium shared between the Federation and Republika Srpska, but has its own form of self-governance. Um, within the Federation, then, you have 10 cantons, each of which have certain uh, aspects of self-rule and governance. And each of these cantons 
uh, has their own government, their own budget, and everything else that goes along with it. Um, and there's a lot of sort of issues that come with this system of governance. And for example, if you look at two different parts of the country in District Birchko, you have governance on two levels. One is the district, which essentially functions as a municipality. And above that, you have Bosnia and Herzegovina, the state. If you live in Sarajevo, you have your municipality within which you live. You have the governance, uh, the government of the city of Sarajevo, uh, the canton of Sarajevo, uh, the Federation of Bosnia and Herzegovina, and the state of Bosnia and Herzegovina. So there's five levels of government that are involved if you're if you live in Sarajevo. And this creates a lot of issues and tensions because the competences are not always clearly defined and the allocation of budget and resources is also not clearly defined. Um, if these lead, sort of tackle some um, religious or ethnic issues, this can also lead to more, uh, more tensions, for example, on schooling and especially minority rights, which sometimes then, um, then, then produce problems in governance. And, and this can be sort of um, seen, seen as an issue. Um, this is the sort of makeup of the country. And uh, yeah, the map is in Cyrillic. I forgot to mention that. The, there, is, there is sort of um, a need to, to use Cyrillic as well. And it, it's one of, the two, uh, one of the two letters that are used, Latin letters and Cyrillic letters. The pink part, that's Republika Srpska, which is sort of uh, consists of these two separate sections connected by that greenish, uh, the greenish territory and the north, which is District Virchko. The federation itself, it has these 10 cantons, uh, the colorful sort of cantons here, each of which then um, has sort of, uh, an, um, mostly has a, a national, an ethnic majority which governs that canton. There are only two cantons which are um, considered ethnically mixed, which don't have a clear majority. And this is the blue one, the middle Bosnia canton, and the one below that, uh, the Herzegovina and Neretva canton. So this is this federal makeup of the country, which has uh, evolved throughout the past 20 years to include several elements of ethnic self-governance. So save for these two cantons that I mentioned, each one of the others has a clear ethnic majority and therefore also is uh, able to allow some segmental autonomy to the ethnic group, which forms the majority in this, in this canton. Um, only these two and, and District Birchko are actually uh, parts of the country where there is no clear ethnic majority. In all of the others, we can actually talk about majority minority rights. Um, so in addition to this, there has been a need to, yeah, so that's based on the principle of group autonomy. Um, in addition to this, there has been a need to include minority protection rights, uh, which is sort of an add-on to power sharing. And this is where you have sort of uh, the the element of individual rights uh, collide, colliding with elements of, of consociationalism and group rights. Because you do have ethnic diversity at this state level, uh, there's <clears throat> strong homogeneity at the micro level, as I mentioned, but within each of these um, cantons and entities, you have minorities of other groups present. And these minorities, they also need to be protected. So um, there have been various sort of court rulings that have enabled this, uh, that for example, all people in parts of the country need to be considered constitutional and equal. Um, this importance of individual human rights is used to, to as a balance against majority ethnic politics uh, at these subnational levels. Um, this aspect that all of the three main groups, so the Serbs, Croats, and Bosniaks, are equally uh, constitutive peoples in all of the territory of Bosnia and Herzegovina is something that was, that was very, very important because it allowed for the use of veto rights at the subnational level as well. Um, other aspects are mostly mentioned under individual human rights, uh, and these are also protected 
uh, through courts at the level of the country, but also um, international courts. Um, and finally, what this does lead to and what this can and does lead to is a form of subnational authoritarianism. And um, just to sort of, and this is where you can contrast Republika Srpska and the Federation of Bosnia and Herzegovina. Um, in Republika Srpska, you have this very clear ethnic majority, a Serb majority. And this case, the subnational unit, uh, uses this sort of uh, majority aspect uh, where there is no uh, essential need for power sharing. Uh, so within Republika Srpska, there's no essential need for power sharing. And uh, the electoral contest is used as a way to actually compete against other Serb parties. Um, currently, the current government in Republika Srpska uh, is sliding towards authoritarianism basically by misusing its position in government to create an electoral advantage for itself. At the same time, the whole country of Bosnia and Herzegovina is not seen as authoritarian. So there is a, delim del uh, a limiting factor uh, where uh, Bosnian, where Republika Srpska uh, tries to uh, um, sort of limit itself uh, in a, in a way where, where politics in Republika Srpska does not uh, influence it. So the, the way that it works in the Federation is that you have power sharing in government, which is required. And uh, in this way, um, there are constraints uh, in this multi-level and cross-ethnic checks and balances in the Federation. So between the cantons, between the Croats and, and Bosniaks especially, that do not allow for uh, a single party to misuse its position to slide towards more authoritarian rule. So in this sense, we have constrainment of, of uh, authoritarianization in the Federation and something that we called deliberate containment of authoritarian politics in Republika Srpska. So these authoritarian politics in Republika Srpska are contained within that subnational unit uh, both uh, as, as, a, as a way to sort of uh, limit, limit checks and balances by other higher up levels. Um, okay, any questions on, on this aspect, on federal aspects of power sharing that you want to ask now? Sorry? I would, uh, would like uh, to ask something very um, practical, <laughs> um, but uh, um, there are a lot of uh, federal elements, uh, powerful uh, uh, subunits, uh, uh, tensions of multi-level governance. So how can uh, the political system uh, um, well function uh, in this difficult situation? Okay, thank you. I'm glad you asked actually, because this, relates a lot to the question here of relevance of European integration. Um, it functions very poorly, to put it that way, very sort of easy way to put it. Uh, there's very many uh, checks and balances and uh, consultations, and the division of competences is not clear all the time. Um, so it functions sort of adequately well at lower levels of government, which are dealing with very practical everyday issues. So for example, issues such as, um, I don't know, municipal roads and these things, they function adequately well um, in most cases. But as soon as you go to higher levels of government, this is where you encounter more and more problems. So for example, in foreign relations, uh, Bosnia and Herzegovina uh, usually votes to abstain on any sort of UN resolution, especially those that involve uh, issues of East versus West, Russian versus US interests, just simply because there is no con uh, consensus in what policy it should take. Um, there are ways that ha this has been attempted to be resolved. So for example, when it comes to European integration, uh, Bosnia and Herzegovina is still at a very early stage in that process. Um, it's in the process of, of attaining candidate status. 
uh, there has been a need to coordinate between these different levels of government. And so uh, with, uh, again, assistance of the international community, uh, the, the government established something called a coordination mechanism, where depending on, on a policy issue, you have to consult all lower levels as well. So if it's foreign policy, you don't need to consult anyone. This is not uh, something that lower levels relate to. But if it is policy about agriculture, for example, this needs to go down a few levels and every level has to get a say. It's a very complex issue, but it is sort of a mechanism that has actually proven to, to work very slowly, uh, very inefficiently, but it produces some results. Okay, is there an, any other question? If not, I would move to the final part, which is about electoral politics and elections and why, how all of this sort of reinforces the rule of, of ethnic parties and ethnic elites. So um, when we talk about elections in Bosnia and Herzegovina, this is what you usually see. It's a lot of faces, a lot of people, and elections have been held very regularly. Uh, and for the most part, they have also been considered to be free and fair, although with certain with certain problematic aspects. Um, and except being regular, they're very predictable elections. They happen exactly at every four years. Uh, not any sooner, not any later than that. Uh, we never had early elections in the country. We never had late elections. Um, so the only delay was due to COVID last year where elections were delayed for about one month. Uh, everything else happened exactly on the first weekend in October. So they're very predictable ones. And in the beginning, these elections were conducted by the international community, um, sort of by the OSCE at that time. And later on, they were conducted since 2002 by the local uh, authorities. There is a central electoral commission which does this and a single law at the state level which governs elections. There has also been several changes of government uh, through elections that did not result in any violence. Uh, and this goes for uh, both Republika Srpska and the Federation and the state level. Any sort of contestation of the elections happened through regular means. So through courts um, that, that then had to look at all of this. But there was, um, except for localized sort of electoral disputes, between voters themselves, actually no real violence of elections. Um, what we use in Bosnia is a sort of element in terms of elections is an element of, of power, of the consociational toolbox of power sharing. And this is proportional representation. It's used at all levels of government. So from the municipality to the, to the level of the, of the state parliament, we use proportional representation, although there are certain special provisions uh, in terms of, uh, for example, at the state level, the final makeup of the parliament has to uh, roughly reflect the, the last census of, in the country. And there's also sort of other special provisions about how many members come from which part, uh, which electoral district and, and so on and so forth. Um, there are no gender-based aspects in these provisions, uh, except for the number of women on, or actually of any gender, on the uh, electoral lists. So that's one that is included in terms of gender representation as a provision, but none in terms of actually getting elected. There is also a first-past-the-post system, which basically means uh, the one who gets most votes wins for a few positions, um, most notably for the presidency of Bosnia-Herzegovina, so the three people, the Croat, the Serb, and the Bosniak, they get elected by the majority of votes um, within that list, within the Croats, Bosniak, and Serb list uh, for which they run. Uh, also, first-past-the-post is used for elections of mayors in municipalities, 
Um, and there you can see that this sometimes produces a bit more, uh, not really conflict, but at least a little bit more tensions uh, in municipalities that are mixed, such as Srebrenica, uh, such as Stolac. What is important to note is that all of this is governed with a single electoral law at the state level. Uh, so there's no special provision, electoral provisions for uh, different parts of the country, uh, which makes it very sort of, uh, how do you say, um, calming, you, one could say to other parties, because in order to change that single electoral law, you have to have an agreement of all the three groups. And any group which is sort of not satisfied with changes to the electoral law can, uh, can enforce a veto on this. Uh, at the same time, there is a professional body, the Central Elector Election Commission, uh, which oversees elections. Uh, for the most part, they have been appointed by political parties, and only more recently have they actually started to take a more independent role uh, outside of party influence. So in terms of what this means for the party system, and this is something I already mentioned, political parties are usually seen as ethnic champions. Uh, they're not seen as representative of the people, of the citizens, but as representatives of their own ethnic group. Uh, this view of parties as ethnic champions uh, leads to competition, which is very much focused on ethnicity and on ethnic lines. Uh, electoral contest, it focuses very much on differences between groups and descriptive representation and very little sort of program-based politics. Um, all competition that does happen uh, usually happens within what I call segmented uh, party subsystems, uh, well, ethnic party subsystems. Uh, and if you have sort of think of a party system and as, as a whole of a country, the one in Bosnia is further divided into three different part or four actually different party systems where competition is only between say Croat parties and only between Serb parties and only between Bosniak parties. And there's also multi-ethnic parties um, that, that also have their own party subsystem. And in effect, this is something that we can call a segmented party system. Bosnia is not unique in this regard. The Netherlands had a segmented party system uh, with different pillars for a very long time. Um, the, the, this sort of first consociational country as such. And what this does lead to, the segmented party system, is that you have a much stronger relevance of so-called ethnic entrepreneurs, which essentially are predatory elites that try to use and misuse ethnicity and ethnic representation to force uh, force their agendas on, on voters, um, usually talking about uh, sort of ethnic uh, issues and, and focusing on diversity and threats rather than, uh, than on politics. And of course, this also leads to large and significant in-group patronage, where ethnic elites are able to use their position to distribute uh, power and resources in order, of course, among their ethnic uh, groups, ethnic citizens in order to further strengthen their position. The role of the European Union in all of this is sort of uh, only now beginning to show because the understanding of Bosnia-Herzegovina as this system of ethnically uh, divided uh, elites was seen as a positive thing for a very long time. And only recently have these unintended consequences of power sharing actually been taken into account more relevantly. And especially through conditionality, through enlargement, there is um, an idea of how you might address this, but still no coherent policy. Um, okay, any questions on this aspect here that you want to ask? Because we're moving slowly towards the end. Um, I wanted to ask uh, something about elections. Um, well, <laughs> are those elections, uh, whether they are kind of regional or uh, communal or whatever, 
uh, affected by uh, European prospect perspectives, uh, like uh, are politicians actually interested in uh, uh, kind of Europe um, European visions or a perspective on a future in the European Union? Um, so yes, they are. Um, there is almost no uh, politician in Bosnia and Herzegovina that publicly uh, says that the country should not become a member of the Union. Um, in that sense, Europe, a European perspective is, is a part of every political program. Um, again, this is declarative for the most part. So while politicians say that they support the European integration of Bosnia, the Europeanization of Bosnia, uh, even some call themselves as the most European politicians in the country, what they actually do is often contrary to their, to their stated goal. Um, in that sense, the, the declarative support of European integration is something that they can still use um, in electoral contest, but they don't have to worry about actually needing to implement this because again, European integration of Bosnia is still a far, is still far away. Um, it's, and, and the population also supports European integration to a very large extent, um, a little bit more so in the Federation than in, in Republika Srpska, um, but there's very little opposition to European integration. And this is primarily due to um, the country being <clears throat> very closely connected and intertwined with, uh, with a common market, uh, with a single market in the European Union, um, with both geographically and economically and politically, uh, it is very closely aligned to, to the EU. So, so there is basically very little alternative to that. Thank you. So there's a sort of a list of, of further readings. I'll stop the screen sharing now so that we can all see each other. And yeah, we still have some time for discussion, right, Roberto? Yes, yes, we do, we do, we do. And uh, so I have, I have a couple of questions, but I want to hold them. Hi, hello, can I? Yes. Uh, I would like to know if, uh, uh, what about the people uh, of, Bo of, Bo of Bosnia and Herzegovina? I mean, uh, do they say something about all the problems uh, and the presence of the international community and the Europe? Okay, I mean, there is sort of a slight disconnect you could say, between the presence of internationals and the people in the country. Um, and also depending on who you ask, so within the country and which international presence you mean. So, for example, if you think about the presence of NATO and the Office of the High Representative, you would see strong support among Bosniaks and, and Croats, but very little support among Serbs. But if you're thinking about the presence of uh, European ambassadors of the European Union, there is sort of strong support among all, all people in the country. But in either case, there is very little sort of direct visibility and, and people don't really care too much, I guess, about international presence at the moment, simply because it has gone down in scale uh, in a, to a very large extent since, since uh, the late 1990s. Especially if you're outside of Sarajevo and Banja Luka, you can you see much more foreign tourists than you do internationals who live there. Even now in pandemic times. Okay, any other questions? Or you can ask one, Roberto. So I, perhaps, perhaps I ask you my, well, first of all, thank you very much. It was very comprehensive, very thorough and great. 
and uh, very useful. Um, I um, I like to ask you basically. I have two two well, I have many, but two really two two questions are um, um, important for me. Um, the first one you are. Um, you mentioned that in your view, um, Republika Srpska is sliding towards uh, authoritarianism, what you call subnational authoritarianism, which is actually one of the arguments of your uh, of your paper. And uh, um, but I um, I like to ask you a little more about uh, um, the federation. I mean. Uh, it, of course, you live in Bosnia and I don't, and I, I, I perhaps, uh, and actually, for sure, I have a limited uh, uh, feeling with uh, with uh, with, uh, with this is this issue. But um, I, I mean, my understanding is that uh, that uh, uh, clientelistic politics, patronage, uh, one-party rule, etc., etc., are very common also in Bosnian and Croat areas, and so. I wonder whether you can explain a little more why you single out the DRS. And I very much agree that <laughs> on your assessment on the DRS, uh, I'm not sure why you seem to be more lenient towards the Federation. And, and ask whether that is true, whether you are more lenient, or, then you will tell me um, more. And, uh, okay. and perhaps I ask also the second question, and so I, I stop. And uh, I was curious to ask you, um, I'm, I'm very interested in what happened in 2014, the rebellions in, um, in, uh, in Bosnia, primarily in the Federation, but um, uh, so that there was a very high profile uh, rejection of uh, peace building, international intervention and transition politics and all the rest. And, uh, and um, and it's very common of social movements to to go through waves uh, and uh, they they flare up uh, at some point for a number of reasons and then they they sort of move away and uh, and then they come back etc uh, etc et but my i wonder what is your assessment of the current uh, um, how can we define it alternative politics in bosnia because there seems to be very little um, a little interest, uh, even, uh, let me just cite you one example, which actually I think you cite in your paper, if I remember, um, the movement Justice Justice for David um, in uh, Republika Srpska, which is a movement to, uh, to, 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 to clarify what happened to a young man who was killed in Republika Srpska in 2017, when was that, a few years ago, um so that that was a, that that gave rise to, to a, a protest movement but it's very interesting interesting that the protest movement was a very nationalistic based so they they themselves claim they they are patriots they are true serbs etc etc so this is just an example of course but the general point i want to ask you is what do you think of this um, what happened to the to the to the protest movement to the extent that there is one today in Bosnia? Thank you, Dana. Okay, so uh, let me first do the the first question about RS and Federation. Uh, I am, I mean, if you put it that way, I'm much more lenient towards the Federation, um, and this is something that I also write in the article when looking at various aspects of uh, limiting opposition parties and their ability to contest elections. Um, in Republika Srpska, you basically have, well, actually, it, I'll first start it this way, both in the Federation and in Republika Srpska, you do have control of patronage, state-owned enterprises, and where one party uses their role in government to distribute resources. And that's common throughout the country. There is no difference in that between either Republika Srpska or the Federation. But what you do have in Republika Srpska is full control of public media, of uh, public broadcast. Uh, so if you are someone living in, in a rural part of the country where you don't have cable TV, the only news that you get is what the ruling party serves you. And this is something where you can see uh, the SNSD and Milorad Dodik basically uh, staffing a lot of, of the people working 
at the at the RTRS, the, the national, the subnational broadcaster, to put it that way. Um, and this is also then translated into to print media. So the main newspapers in Republika Srpska are also pro-government. Uh, there is very little alternative information uh, sources of information. Uh, the second thing is uh, a misuse of um, of essentially police forces. Uh, this is what we could have seen in in the Pravda za Davida, what you also mentioned later. In Republika Srpska, uh, the police was used to sort of disperse protests against the government itself. Um, Nonviolent protests against the government, um, just simply because they were seen as a threat. And this has never happened in the Federation, where police was used. 2014, uh, that there was some beating of. I'll come people. to that. Yes, but that Sorry, was sorry. not that. That was uh, a dis uh, that was as a consequence of destruction of public property. So that's slight, slightly different. There's a small difference there. Well, the RS police basically used force against protesters that were not setting buildings on fire, to put it that that blatantly. Yeah, yeah. So there is a small difference there. Yeah, yeah. Um, and the the essence is also that uh, the RS government, the Republic of Srpska government, has seen these protests as a direct threat to its own survival. Um, and there you can see sort of the difference between the plenums movement and the more recent uh, justice for David or justice for uh, Jenna. And you also have a similar sort of issue in the Federation um, where it, the problem is in police accountability and accountability of elected politicians. That is seen as the main problem. Um, the 2014 protests, uh, I would say that they came at a very specific moment in time. This was uh, sort of the, the, the lowest end of economic stagnation in Bosnia and Herzegovina after the 2008 economic crisis. <clears throat> and a lot of these protests, they were not led by issues of political accountability. They were just simply uh, led by, by an idea of uh, we need sort of politicians that are able to provide to us. And uh, they were led this, by this idea that if governance is not able to provide jobs, then let us let us govern uh, instead. Uh, the plenums that were organized tried to provide this alternative way of governance, um, but it was very much sort of non-organized, non-structured, and not able to do so. Uh, so you do have this sort of idea of public rejection of governance, um, both as a consequence of the Justice for David Jena movements and of the plenums, but the reasoning behind it is slightly different. Uh, sort of accountability of ruling parties is, is what is now much more the focus, and especially this connection of parties to police forces, while previously it was uh, a lack of economic governance. So we might see something like the plenums again uh, if, if the COVID pandemic produces an environment that, that leads to larger unemployment and stagnating wages. Um, but currently, uh, it's much more, the, the protests are much more oriented toward protests against the ruling party and their misuse of power. And there you can definitely see a differentiation between Republika Srpska, which very strongly misuses uh, many elements of power it has. Uh, it's not constrained by any power sharing, any uh, sort of checks and balances. In the Federation, there's uh, a very strong constraint that sometimes leads to uh, ineffective governance and in immobility of government. Uh, but then again, it does not allow for a single party to misuse these resources. I hope that makes sense. Yeah, yeah, no, no, very, very much. Thank you. I want to give the opportunity to students to jump in if they wish. Okay, if anyone wants to join, ask a question or comment.
I think I, sorry, Daniel, I think I missed your last slide. There was a slide with some bibliography. Is that, is that right? You, perhaps you, you may, you want to share it again or maybe, or? I'll send it in the chat now so that anyone who's interested can, can copy that if that's okay. Sure, sure, absolutely. The first two are sort of articles that I already sent around. The others are additional ones that relate to, to a lot of what I've been talking about. Oh, just a second. For some reason, I seem to not be able to do this. Again, if it's not possible, I'll just share this. Uh, well, don't, don't worry, maybe. Um, or I'll send it to you. Yeah, exactly, exactly, and then I can, I can share it. Okay, is there any anyone else uh, who wants to ask a question or make a comment? <clears throat> If not, we can thank Dami very much for his time and his lecture. And um, well, thank you really. And and I I hope to to, to see you in actually in Trento in uh, in the fall if everything goes. Yeah, well. if everything goes well, <laughs> there might be an opportunity to see each other again. Exactly, exactly. In, uh, that would be nice. That, would, that 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 actually would be a good um, a good sign for the, the the pandemic situation. If you can actually travel and spend a week or two or whatever in uh, in Trento in Italy, so that that would be exactly nice. <laughs> exactly. Okay, so Damir, thank you again, and thanks to to the students and uh, and um, and yes. we'll, uh, thank you for the invitation. Okay. Be well and uh, you too, and all of you yeah. stay in touch. Okay. Bye. Bye.